All right, Shabbat Shalom from Israel. Uh, it is Shabbat here for us out in the land. The sun is down. Um, we are in fellowship. We are in praise and worship, and we are just in rest of our King. Um, I got a kind of on-the-fly message for you guys, something that Yah's really been uh, putting on my heart these past few days and even a couple of weeks. Um, with the season that, that we're in right now and with everything that uh, I believe Yah is teaching our family and and uh, showing us in the scriptures and showing me in the scriptures in my personal study time. Um, so this, as you guys can see from the title, uh, is going to be um, a series. Now, Brother Paul started the series, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, the series is going to be called Lessons in the Wilderness Series. And Brother Paul spoke um, a few weeks ago about you know, the, the Israelites in the wilderness and, and everything that they went through and the lessons that, that we need to learn from their actions and from their, their disobedience and from what they went through. And this is going to just continue, continue that because uh, for the past couple of weeks, you know, we live in the desert and technically the desert was considered the wilderness in scripture and so i always try to pay attention to my surroundings and see what i can learn from them especially you know how often we go out hiking and stuff and we're just out there looking at the hills and everything and, and yaz just really put it on on my heart um you know what what the wilderness is and what it, what it means to be in the wilderness uh what what we need to learn while while we're in the wilderness and how faithful we need to be during the time that we're in the wilderness because it doesn't matter how old we get. It doesn't matter how much we grow in Yah. Um, we're all going to go through wilderness times no matter what. Until the day Yeshua returns, there's going to be a time where we, are we feel like we're showered with blessings and everything's going right. And there's going to be a time where we feel like we're in the dry desert with no food, no water. Um, and, and nothing before us in the physical, so it seems. But we need, to, we need to understand that that's not the case. What we see in the physical is not always what is our reality. What our reality is is that Yah promises that He'll always be with us. What our reality is is that Yah promises that if we obey Him, if we are faithful to Him, if we don't tempt Him, then the clothes will not wear on, on our bodies. The sandals will not wear on our feet. We will be fed by every, every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yehovah. And so with that being said, the title of this um, little message here is uh, Tempting Yehovah. Tempting Yehovah. Is it, is it actually possible, Mishpaha, that we can tempt Yehovah? How, when I came across this verse, in the Torah, it just, it just blew my mind. It's like, how is it possible for man to tempt Yehovah? Just think about that for a second. He is our creator. He is, he is the, the, the El of Elohim. He is Yah Almighty. And so how is it that us as his people, us as the father's children can, can tempt him? Well, Let's, let's read about it, Mishpacha. Let's read it. We're going to start off this, this little, this little message here in Exodus 17, verse 2. And this is going to be the basis of this message. This is going to be attack, attacking um, the heart that we need to completely get out of us, the mentality, the, the mindset that we need to get completely completely out of us and get rid of and just beg Yah to remove it from us because it's dangerous. It's dangerous to be in. So Exodus 17, starting in verse 2, it says, Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt Yehovah. So if we look at the context of these verses, and I'm going to be going over a lot of these verses, what, what I'm going to do basically is I'm going to take every single time that we see the Israelites in the different parts of the wilderness, there's different 
uh, if we look on a the map, there's different uh, deserts. There's different parts of the desert, different wildernesses that, that Israel traveled through. And every single one that they encountered, there's a, there's a lesson to be learned from it. There's a lesson to, to glean from every, everything that they encountered during those, those times of journeying and traveling through their fails, failures, through their successes, through Yah's faithfulness, all of that. And so if we look around in chapter 16 and even throughout verse 17, we see Israelites' heart of complaining, Mishpacha. They were contending with Moses. They were complaining, where is our water to drink? They were complaining. And this, this is how we tend to Yahweh. When we have a heart that complains, when we have a mind, when we have a mentality, when we allow ourselves to come into the flesh and we become ungrateful and we show our ungrateful attitudes and our ungrateful hearts through our mouths, through complaining, through speaking against Yah, through speaking against the blessings that he's given us, through speaking against his faithfulness and his goodness. Because the fact of the matter is, if we look at everything that Yah has done for, for Israel, he, he gave them manna from heaven at this point. He gave them, he gave them quail. He gave them water previously um, in Exodus 15. He parted the Red Seas, and yet still, they complained against him and, and they said, where is our water? We have no water. We're going to die. That is tempting Yehovah. And why is that tempting Yehovah? Because we're basically saying that when we complain, when we, we're doubting. And when we're doubting, we're saying that he's not capable of coming through for us. He's not, he's not capable to be faithful to us like he promised to be. And that right there, Mishpachah, tempts Yehovah to bring down judgment on us. It tempts him to judge us. It tempts him to, to humble us. It tempts him to carry out judgment on, on us because we deserve it. We deserve it immediately. I mean, if we look at the examples that we see with Aaron and uh, Miriam and how, and how they complained against Moshe and how they contended with Moshe the first time and said, you know, you're, you're, you're not the only one that needs to be in leadership. Basically, they were challenging him. They were complaining against him because they felt like he, you know, walked around with all the authority like he was above everybody else. Not, not in a bad way. Moshe was in the spot that Yah gave him, but they were jealous of it, and they, were, they began to complain about it. And what did Yah do? Immediately, he struck Miriam with leprosy. Immediately. That was, that was a, an immediate effect. The same thing we see with, with Korah. He complained, and he caused a rebellion. And what happened to them? They were swallowed up by the earth. So, so Yah judged a complaining heart in the time of Moshe, in the time of the Torah, immediately. It was, it was, it was a sin so great that he ex ex uh, executed fast and harsh judgment to show the people, I'm not playing around with this. I don't want this among my people. I don't want this, this complaining heart, this attitude um, in, in the households of my people, in, in the families of my people. Get rid of it. Get rid of it or I will. And we, we need to understand that although we're in a period of grace right now, although we're, we're, we're saved by grace and we don't have immediate judgment like they did because of Yeshua and how he died on the cross for our sins, taking our penalty, we don't get the right to complain. We don't get the right to say whatever we want. We don't get the right when things aren't going our way, when, when we're upset with our surroundings or when things happen to us that we don't understand. We, we don't get the right. It's not even a right, Ms. We, we can't allow ourselves to go into the mindset of even thinking for a second that it is okay to complain because that tempts Yah. It, his word is the same. He's the same. He stayed the same. If it tempted him then, it tempts him now. And he would have every right to judge me in any way that he saw fit if I, if I was walking in this, in this mind of, of complaining or ungratefulness, especially after the things that, that Yah, I've seen Yah do in my life. I've seen Yah do 
for us here while, while we've been in Israel with the congregation, the ministry that, that I've been blessed to be a part of uh, these last five years. Man, Mishpacha, if Yah has, if Yah has done anything great for you in which if you're alive, if you are well, if you have a job, if you have a family, if you have food to eat, if you have water to drink, then Yah has been good to you. Yah has been good to you. And you have no right, we have no right to complain. And this is this is what's really been heavy on my heart because that's what, unfortunately, that's all the Israelites did in the wilderness. That is literally, no matter how many times y'all came through for them, they continue to complain. And we need to learn from that. We really do need to learn from that. We can't just read over it and say, man, Israel, man, they they sucked. They they couldn't get it right, could they? No. Because we are guilty of the same things in our lives. We are guilty of being ungrateful. We are guilty of complaining right after we receive a, a blessing from Yah, you know, at the first sight of a hurdle or at the first sight of a challenge or something happens that, that you know, we, we don't think is fair, then what happens? We do the same thing. So we need to look at these scriptures in a way of what can we learn from this so that we don't make the same mistakes. Amen. So we'll go to... Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. And this is the first area of the wilderness that uh, Israel encountered. And it's going to be the wilderness of Shur. So Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 23. And it says, So Moshe brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moshe, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to Yehovah, and Yehovah showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statue and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them. That's a key thing right, right here in these, in these series that we're going to be doing, these, these messages, is that Yehovah tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of Yehovah your Elohim and do what is right in his sight, Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am Yehovah who heals you. Who heals you. What was one of the, what was one of the plagues that Egypt had to go through? Their crops dying, their animals dying, which would have produced starvation, which would have produced hunger. And Yah says, I will not plague you with these things. If you diligently obey my voice, if you keep my commandments, if you give ear to everything that I am giving to you in my laws and in my precepts, in my Torah, no matter where you are at, no matter how bad it seems in the physical, no matter how dry the land may seem in the physical, if you remain obedient, then I will not plague you with these things. I will not, I will not judge you with these things like you saw Egypt being judged instead. I will provide for you. I will be faithful to you. I will lead you to the, to the waters to drink. I will guide you in the way that you should go. But again, we see time and time again, Israel being, complain, being in the place of complaining and being blessed by Yah, being taken care of. He gave them their water. He gave them their water, but he said that I'm testing your heart. I'm testing to your heart to see whether or not you will obey my commands. We have to understand, Ms. Rakha. We have to understand and look at things through spiritual eyes as often as we can, all the time. That everything that we encounter, everything that we face, every challenge that we face is a test. It's a test, family. Every, every hardship, every battle, every trial... It is, it is some form of test to, to see whether or not we're going to remain faithful to Yah because he was faithful to death. He was faithful. Yeshua was faithful to the end. He even begged the Father that if at all possible, 
Father, take this cup from me, but nevertheless, your will be done. He knew how hard it was going to be. He knew how painful it was going to be. And even through the wilderness, Satan tempted him and tried to get him to quit his fast and tried to get him to bow down to him. But Yeshua remained faithful. That's the example. That's the example that we need to follow during our times of testing, during our times in the wilderness when we don't understand everything, when when our finances think, you know, we think that they're falling apart or, you know, our children are having issues, or our marriages are having issues. You know, of course we always do. And in, in, in a test, this is what I would advise. And this is what I always do. And Angela and I always do for our household that if we're encountering a test, if we're encountering a spiritual wilderness or hardship, the first thing, the first thing we do is look at ourselves. And we go to Yah in prayer and we ask ourselves, Father, is there anything that we have done to bring this upon ourselves? Because we can inflict on ourselves, you know, consequences for our actions that may look like a test, but really we are in sin. And Yah is trying to get our attention and show us, hey, you're sinning right now. Wake up. So that's the first thing we do is pray and ask God, Father, is there anything that we have done to profane you? Is there anything that we have done that is not in line with your word? Is there anything that we need to change? Anything that we need to repent for? And, and you know, we pray about that and we ask God, we do um, uh, uh, an introspection like we, like we should. Um, and then after that, if, if, if we feel like it's just something that we need to go through, then we just ask God, please help us to remain faithful. Please help us no matter how bad it seems in the physical, no matter how bad it seems like, you know, we, we don't, we're not going to have enough, you know, bread to eat or water to drink or, you know, what have you. We don't know what's going to happen with, with this job or we don't know what's going to happen with, you know, some, some plans that we had set up. We pray wholeheartedly, God, please allow us to remain faithful and please lead us and guide us during this test so that we don't make the wrong decision because the enemy will try to use our time in the wilderness as a, as a, as a, an advantage. He'll try to use an attack, use us and attack us because he knows that we're going through it, that we're vulnerable, that we're susceptible. We, 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 we're being tested. We're being tried. And so just like Yeshua was tempted in the wilderness, you better believe that Hasatan does the same thing to us, that when we're going through the wilderness, that when we're going through tests, that he's going to be right there in our ears whispering things like, you see, you don't know what you're doing. You see, you, 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 you don't really you know, follow Yah the right way, or you see, you, you made a bad choice. Yah's, Yah's you know, not going to give you anything because of, of your past or because of this bad decision you made or because, you know, you're a bad person or, or whatever. You don't truly belong to him or that's not really sin. Or you, that, that's not that big of a deal to Yah. All of these things he tries to whisper in our ears, Mishpacha, especially during the time of testing, especially during our time in the wilderness. And we need to remain faithful and stand on his word like Yeshua did. Every response, I love that Yeshua's example in the wilderness. Every response that Yeshua gave Hasatan was straight out of scripture. He quoted Torah every single time. Every single time. And we need to stand firm in that same mindset of just being so focused on Yah's word that no matter what Hasatan throws at us in our thought life, in the physical, through people, that we go back to his word and that we proclaim his word. So with that being said, um, we read Exodus 15, through 23. And we talked about the wilderness of Shur. And I'll add that Shur also means wall from the Hebrew. It means wall, literally. And I think that that's perfectly fitting because when we go through the times of testing and, and the wilderness, it literally feels like we hit a wall. It literally feels like we've hit a brick wall and we're put at a dead halt. And it's like sometimes it can happen at the most unexpected time. Sometimes it seems like we've got a lot of momentum going and we're fired up and everything is going good. And then boom, you just hit a brick wall. You hit, you hit that, that, that wilderness of sure. You hit the wall that just puts you at a, at a dead halt, and you're, you're looking around like the Israelites did. They didn't see any water. They were thirsty. They were stuck there for three days. It was dry. It was hot. Their circumstances sucked, 
and and they complained. They started getting you no. Know, they started getting upset and angry and allowed their emotions and allowed their their flesh to take over and they're worrying and they're doubting Yah and they tempted Yah. They tempted them. They tempted him with their thoughts, with their mouth, with their actions. So again, I think that's huge for us to learn from. I think that's huge for us to be mindful of how we're speaking when we're being tempted, of how we're how we're how we're acting, how we're walking, how we're how we're talking, the example that we're giving to others when we're going through the wilderness, because everybody knows that the world watches believers. And and I truly I truly am convinced that the world watches believers under a microscope when they see that believer is going through a test. When they see that believer is encountering some kind of difficulty, they're always watching and seeing what's gonna happen. Are they gonna renounce their faith? Are they gonna, you know, curse you Are they gonna are they gonna go back on what they believe? Are they gonna start falling and start turning to other things in the world like drinking or smoking or, or worldly things or anything like that to be used as an outlet? Mr. How we have to we have to stay faithful to the word. We have to we have to. So next verse I'll read. I'm going to cover the, the few different times that we see uh, the wilderness of shore uh, in scriptures. And it's used, let's see, it's used one, two, three, four, five, six times throughout scripture. Um, Focusing in on the wilderness of shore here, it's used six times throughout Scripture, and we're going to read through, we're going to read over each of them, and we're going to see the lessons that can be learned through this. Um, we're going to see some people continue to tempt Jehovah, others they were faithful and they they were given a blessing, they were given the blessings of Yah. So, let's see, so the next one we'll read is going to be, it's in Genesis sixteen seven, um, and actually. Uh, this is the first time the wilderness of Shur is mentioned, and it's with Hagar. Uh, it's it's uh, Genesis sixteen seven. It says, "Now the angel of the Lord," and we did a teaching on that. Um, the last couple of Shabbats, last Shabbat specifically, Malach Yehovah. We went all into that. It was amazing. It was it was exciting. It was one of the most fun teachings I ever did with Brother Paul. So I encourage you guys. If you missed that one, go check that out. We get into Mal Malach Yehovah and who he is and everything that he represents according to Yehovah Yeshua. So um, check that one out if you haven't got to already. It's actually a two-part series. You'll want to check out both parts. Um, it says, Now Malach Yehovah found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. This was Hagar's test with Sarai and Ishmael. Uh, we know that it wasn't really Hagar's fault what happened between uh, her, Abram, and Sarai. It wasn't, I mean, they, Abram and Sarai were the ones that made the decision. Like Sarai said, you know, we're, we're waiting on Yah. It's taking a while. Go into my maidservant Hagar that we can produce this child. And basically in our own knowledge and our own strength and our own understanding. And we know that that was wrong. We know that Yah specifically told Abraham that Sarah would bore him a child and that he would be the one to inherit the promise. Um, but Abraham and Sarah were in their test. They were in their wilderness and they made a few bad decisions. We see that in scripture. So Hagar had her child, Ishmael, and what happened? Sarah despised her. Sarah, de Sarah was despised in her heart to the point where she became so, you know, envious of her and jealous of her that she sent her off. She said, get her out of here. I don't want to look at her. I don't want to see her anymore, you know. <clears throat> and Hagar was really discouraged by that. And she, you know, wanted to leave because you know, she didn't want to be around that kind of treatment. Who would? You know, who would? She First, she was basically told, hey, you're going to lay with your master and provide us a child that's not really going to be yours. And then she starts, you know, being ostracized for it. So who would want to return to that kind of treatment? She was in a test as well. She was in a wilderness as well here in Shur. And Malak Yehovah literally meets with her. He meets with her and tells her that, you know, fear not. I will, you know, I'm going to bless I'm going to multiply the descendants of your son. 
I'm going to multiply his lineage. Now, we know that the lineage of Ishmael was not a good lineage, but nevertheless, Yah said that he would multiply his descendants, and he has. The descendants of Ishmael have, have multiplied. They're, they're, they're grown in great multitude, just like the people of Abraham did. And they even inhabited a lot of lands around um, that, that Middle Eastern, this Middle Eastern area. Now, what did Hagar do during her test? Because Yah told her, go back to your servant and submit yourself. Go back to your servant and, and honor her. Go back, I'm sorry, not your servant, your master. Go back to your master, Sarah, and honor her. Go back to the place that you have come and, and honor Sarah, your master. And she did it. She, she listened. She, she obeyed that commandment from Yehovah. And she cried out. She, she declared that place El Roy. You are El Roy. You are the God who sees because he sees, he sees me, even lowly old me, a servant, uh, uh, um, a maid servant, uh, you know, in a, in a Bedouin camp, you know, who has, who has a child that isn't worthy of the promises of Yah, you know, according to other people. Um, but even me, he sees. Yah sees me. And, and Mishpachah, that's, that's so powerful because sometimes the enemy tries to get us to think that we're not worth anything. That because of the, the, the past mistakes or decisions that we've made or because of, you know, things that have happened to us in our lives, that we're not worthy to receive the promise. That we're not worthy to, to walk in complete obedience to Yah's Torah, be blessed. And, and have, have an abundance of blessings. Like Deuteronomy 28 says, my blessings will overtake you. They will overtake you, it says, if we obey him. But, but Hasatan tries to lie, to tries to steal and destroy everything that Yah wants to do with us. But Malak Yehovah, who is Yehovah, Yeshua, he gave Hagar and her son their own, their own promise, their own gift, their own promise. And so Yah's faithful. He's faithful to come through in his promises. He's, he's faithful to, to follow through with his word. The next, the next time we see the wilderness of Shur is going to be Genesis 20. Genesis 20, verse 1. And it says, <clears throat> And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed there in Gerar. Now, if we read through this chapter, we find that this is Abraham's test with King Abimelech. And Sarah, you know, he Abraham lied and said that Sarah was his sister. And in fact, when, he, when she was his wife and King Abimelech took Sarah, thinking that she was Abraham's sister and wanted to take her and make her his wife. And what happened? Yah immediately put curses on Abimelech's house, and Yah immediately judged Abimelech because of the anointing that Abraham walked in. Even though he lied, he was wrong for lying. He should have stood bold, and he should have been faithful in this test, in this trial of uncertainty. What's He was afraid. Out of fear, he lied. But even so then, because Yah had ordained Abraham and Sarah for a specific purpose, he was like, no way am I going to let Abimelech, even though Abraham lied, no way am I going to let Abimelech take Sarah as his, his wife, because I have specific plans and a promise to carry out through her that are bigger than themselves. They're bigger than these, these plans, this promise that Yah gave Abraham and Sarah were bigger than themselves. They didn't even, they didn't, they couldn't even fully comprehend that everything that Yah would do through them, um, creating a nation, creating the 12 tribes of Israel, creating the tribe of Israel that would later give birth to Messiah and everything that that implies. So Yah, that's why I believe Yah immediately plagued Abimelech's house. And Abimelech came out and said, why have you done this thing to me? Why have you put me in this situation? Why didn't you just tell me she was your wife? And instead of allowing her to, to come into my place and allowing me to be cursed this way, you know, Yah could have killed me, basically, he, he, was, he was saying to Abraham. And he, of course, he gave, we know the story, he gave Sarah back to Abraham. But that just shows, Mishpacha, that in our trials, in our, in our times in the wilderness, in the, in the times where we hit the wall in the wilderness, in the test, we can't be afraid. We can't, regardless of the 
Abraham sinned when he Abraham Abraham was wrong for lying in that way. And we need to we need to look at that and and learn from that in, in a sense of we can't let our circumstances ever be an excuse for sinning. We can't let our circumstances ever be an excuse to cause us to lie out of fear or cause us to complain um, out of fear or doubt or worry so much. Um, because I'll tell you what, worrying and and doubting and In the name of Yeshua, please, please reconnect. In the name of Yeshua, please reconnect. In the name of Yeshua. <clears throat> Come on. Nah, it, it's it's trying to reconnect. Please reconnect, please. Is still trying to reconnect. Oh, come on. We have too many things open. I don't know. Come on. Come on, please reconnect the codes. You're, you're live. 
You can still see me? Yeah, you're still going. Are you serious? Yeah, you're sitting there at the screen. That is really weird. Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> wow, that is strange. All right. Um, so forgive me for just sitting here, Mr. <laughs> but um, on my screen, it, it says trying to reconnect. So I, I didn't, I was waiting for it to reconnect. I didn't think that I was still live. So if I'm just sitting here looking around, that's why I've been actually just waiting and hoping and praying that this reconnected. But uh, Brother Paul said I'm still going, so praise y'all. I'm going to keep going. So where, where I was, we just read uh, Genesis 20, verse 1. Um, and then the next place we see Genesis 25 is uh, verse 18. Um, and... Um, this is the place where it records Esau's death. So the wilderness of Shur <clears throat> is where Esau died. I just thought that that was interesting. I just wanted to note that. <clears throat> and then the next place we see the wilderness of Shur is going to be 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 7. And it says, And Shaul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur which is east of Egypt. So if you want to look on a map, you can find where Shur is. It's still Egyptian territory, east of, of Egypt, going into, um, you're starting to go into the bottom of the land of Canaan in Israel. Um, so 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 7, and it says, And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. Um, now, if we look at the rest of this, especially in verse 8, we see Shaul did not, did not pass his test. Verse 8 says that he also took King Agog alive when he was specifically told not to. And he not only took King Agog alive, he killed all the people, yet he took all of the best oxen, sheep, and cattle to keep for himself. When Samuel specifically told him that Yah wanted him to wipe everything of those people out, he wanted him to wipe everything out. He didn't want he didn't want uh, the Israelites to take any of their goods, any of their their belongings. He wanted it all to be terminated. And Shaul did not listen. Shaul took matters into his own hands. And in this place right here near the wilderness of Shur, we we read. As Yah says, uh, when we read in De or excuse me, Exodus um, 15, verse 25, it says there he tested them. He tested them in sure. He tested Saul in sure to see if he was going to obey his commands or not. And Saul did not obey. Saul did not obey. He did not carry out the command of the king the way he was told to. And what happened after this? is devastating, Mishpacha. Saul was literally, because of this, Saul was rejected as king. Saul was rejected as king after this. Let's go to this chapter, and I'm going to read a little more from this chapter. So if we go to 1 Samuel, verse uh, chapter 15, verses 7, if we like right after this happens, Mr. Paul, this is why it's so important for us to stay faithful in the wilderness. This is why it's so important for us to not forsake the Torah and the commands and having a heart of gratitude, no matter how bad things get. This is why it's so important for us to do that. This is why we we need to understand the severity of being faithful in every season. So Right after this happens, we read that, that Shaul spared the king and he took all the goods and he defied the commandment of Yah. We read in verse 10, it says, Now when the word of Yehovah came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Shaul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried out to Yehovah all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Shaul, it was, it was told, Samuel saying, Shaul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself, and he has gone around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. 
Then Samuel went to Shaul, and Shaul said to him, Blessed are you of Yehovah. I have performed the commandment of Yehovah. But, Shema, but Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? And Shaul said, They have, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen a sacrifice to Yehovah Elohim, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Shaul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what Yehovah said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak on. So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, you were, not he were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not Yehovah anoint you king over Israel? Now Yehovah sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of Yehovah? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of Yehovah? And Shaul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of Yehovah and gone on the mission which Yehovah sent me and brought back Agag, the king of, the Amal of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to Yehovah, your Elohim, in Gilgal. So Samuel said, Has Yehovah as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of Yehovah? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Yehovah, he also has rejected you from being king. Then Shaul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I transgressed the commandment of Yehovah on your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship Yehovah. There was no going back after that. He begged Samuel to, to stay with him, to plead to Yehovah for him. But there was no going back after that, Mishpacha. He didn't listen to the commandment of the king, to Yah's word during his test. Yah tested Saul to see whether or not he would obey his commands. And I find it very interesting that it happens in this very same place, the place of Shur, the wilderness of Shur, that all of this happens, that Saul re re rebels against the command of Yah, that Saul literally falls as king, and he's rejected, and it's in a why. Why, why, why did he, what was his excuse? Because he listened to the people. He listened to the voices of the people instead of the commandment of Yah. And we even see that Moses fell almost to the same thing. When, when he listened to the voices of the people, he let, he let the complaints and the voices of the people overwhelm him to the point where when Yah told him to speak to the rock, he didn't speak to it. He hit it with the staff. And he disobeyed Yah. Sometimes in our wilderness, sometimes in our trial, we're going to have people in our ears, Ms. Baha. We're going to have people telling us, this is what you need to do. No, you, you're, you're out of line. You're not, you're not doing this right. Or Yah didn't really tell you to do that. Or maybe you're going too far. Or maybe you need to stop doing something. Or maybe you need to start doing this. Or maybe, maybe you just need to rethink something. Ms. Baha, we need to be careful who we listen to. We need to be very careful with who we listen to, especially during our, our wilderness moments. When we're going through a test and somebody comes to us with a word, somebody comes to us with advice or a suggestion, we really need to um, guard our ears and guard our hearts. Um, not to be disrespectful to somebody, but just to be, just to test the spirits like the scripture says. And, yeah, and the enemy will use anyone he can to think that, to try to get us to think that, what we're doing, you know, what we're doing is right, or in fact, when we're wrong, like like Saul, Saul literally thought he was doing a good thing. He thought he was doing a good thing, even though it was against Yah's word. He thought he was doing a good thing by taking the animals and, and actually trying to sacrifice them for Yah. And Yah told him, "I don't want those animals. I wanted them killed, and you didn't listen." That's why we need to test everything. Test everything according to this word right here. Test everything to the commandment of Yah. Because if Saul would have 
heeded the commands instead of people and their voices and their opinions and what they wanted, then he would have been fine. He would have said, no, I don't know what you people are talking about. You guys are crazy. Y'all gave us a specific commandment to do. That is what we need to do. We, if, when people come to us with, with, with advice that is contrary to what Yah has given us, is contrary to the commandments of Yah, we need to say, look, I, 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 don't, I don't receive that. I don't want what you're saying. I don't, hear, I don't want to hear it. Don't go against Yah's word. Don't tell me anything, uh, whether you mean good or, or, or evil. It doesn't matter. If it's against Yah's word, I don't want to hear it. I'm not going to receive it because the enemy tries to be very cunning and he'll even come as, a, as an angel of light to try to trick us, to try to get over on us like he got over on Saul. And Saul was rejected as king after that. He fell. He fell hard. So may we learn from that. The next time we see the wilderness of Shur is actually in 1 Samuel again, uh, chapter 27, verse 8. Chapter 27, verse 8, and it says, And David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites and the, Ger the, the Gerzites and the Amalekites, for those nations were the inhabitants of the land from old. As you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. So Shur was also used as a, like a, a how, do we, how do you say, like a marker, like a border. Um, throughout scripture, you'll see... Uh, Different different border markings for territory. Sure, was also used as one of those because of how far uh, southwest it is, and this this was a land that was inhabited by evil people all the time. And and Saul and David and and even even Joshua um, fought against people in this land uh, time and time again. And it says that when David encountered the people of this land, wherever David attacked. The land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and he returned and came to Achish. So here we see David being faithful to what Yah commanded him to do. David, he said, it says that whenever he attacked, he killed everybody, and when Yah permitted it, when Yah allowed it, he kept the animals. Because if Yah didn't permit it, if Yah didn't allow it, if Yah gave him a specific command, David was faithful to carry it out. That was a big difference between David and Saul. David had a heart of, of obedience to Yah. Even though he fell, David had a completely different heart than Shaul did. He, he honored Yah's word. He obeyed and kept Yah's charge. And, that's, and this happened near the wilderness of Shur. Again, we see. So here's David's example of being obedient in this wilderness being obedient to what Yah has given him. So those are the different places that we find this wilderness. And I just want to recap. Um, in Exodus 15, uh, 22 through 27, they went three days without water in Marah. And in verse 27, it says, A statute and an ordinance was made because Yah tested them. It's a test, Mr. Ha. Everything, everything we endure, everything that we go through on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. You might be going through the wilderness every single day at the, at the job that you work at. You might be going through the wilderness with some of your own family members who, who persecute you because of your beliefs, because you keep Torah. You might be going through the wilderness with your health or with the health of a loved one or some kind of issue within your home and your marriage. You know, there's, there's many different forms of trials and tests that we can endure. There's many different forms of, of wildernesses that we can encounter in this life. But the important thing is, Mishpacha, the important thing is, is that we remain faithful in the wilderness. That no matter what it looks like in the physical, no matter what it looks like to us, you know, what we're lacking or what, what we're missing. I'm pulling up some more verses here because I'm going to have a couple of closing verses I'm going to read for you guys before I, I close this out. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of verses in Philippians, and then the last verse I'll read will be in Deuteronomy. But again, we must focus on being faithful, being obedient, not complaining, not tempting Yah, not tempting Him ever. No matter how bad it gets, 
no matter how no matter how awful we feel like our situation is, we cannot tempt Yah. We cannot complain against Him. We cannot allow ourselves to go into that place of being ungrateful, Mishpacha. Because in all reality, Yah doesn't have to give us anything. Yah has already given us everything with when He created us with with His sacrifice on the cross when He died for our sins. In all reality, Yah doesn't have to give us anything. He doesn't have to give us answers to our questions. He doesn't have to give us anything, Mishpacha. But because He loves us and because He honors and stays true to His word, that says when we're obedient, that He will bless us. He will take care of us. So. The next few verses here, these closing verses, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, and it says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of Elohim, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Wow. Among among a crooked and perverse generation. Mishra, I don't need to say this. We can look around and see how much complaining is going on in politics, in the, in the body of Messiah. Everybody's complaining about something. Everybody, every, every group of people has their own beliefs and their own stances on, on where they are and what they think and everything. And, and all they want to do is proclaim. They don't, even, they don't even properly give their stance on things anymore. They don't uh, political parties and different people. They don't even give their, their 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 stance on why they think the way they think or why they believe what they believe. All they do is complain about everyone else's beliefs and everyone else's stances. How we how are we gonna be uh, like it says here, blameless and harmless children of Elohim to a generation like this, to a poor and crooked generation, a perverse and crooked generation, if we're literally allowing ourselves to do the same thing and complain. And, and tempt Yah and have a heart that's not grateful and have a heart that doesn't proclaim his name regardless of the situation that we're in. We need to be very careful because as I stated earlier, the world is watching. People are watching us. And we can't allow ourselves to, to stoop down to the level of complaining like the world does. Man, there's so much complaining that goes on today. It is so bad. This generation is just so horribly pampered, so horribly entitled that literally everyone has something to complain about every single day it's it's, it's sad philippians 4:11 philippians 4:11 says note that i speak in regard to need for i have learned in whatever state i am to be content to be content we need to make that that conscious effort that conscious decision no matter what happens, Ava, I will praise you. No matter what it looks like in my physical uh, situation, I will praise you. Come rain or shine, I will praise you. Come food or no food, I will praise you. Come water or no water, I will praise you. No matter what our situation is doing to us in our flesh or emotionally, we need to make that decision to be content with everything that Yah gives us, to be content that if Yah were to take everything away from us, like he did to Job, that we will be content. Yah gives and takes away, that we will be faithful in praising his name, that we will be faithful to honor his name. That is, that is the huge takeaway from this message. Do not tempt Yah. Do not complain. Be faithful through everything. I beckon you, family. And I'm talking to myself as much as I am anybody else. This is a lesson that I'm still learning. This is a lesson that Yah is still showing me and teaching me that regardless of what's going on, I have no right to complain. Any, anytime, anytime you feel like you're, you're being tempted to complain, think of Messiah and what he went through for us. Think of Job and what he went through. Think of, think of Messiah and the beating that he took. Think of the, the gruesome pain that he felt for you, for me, for your children, for your families, and be content, Mishpacha. We, we just, that's why we need to be transformed through the renewing of our mind, because we literally need to transform our minds from what they were before 
you know, when we live in the world, we're used to having things our way or going after what we want, being go-getters or whatever. And when it doesn't work out, we get upset. We feel like we failed and we complain and what was me? We feel sorry for ourselves, all this stuff. But we need to transform that and we need to have our mind renewed by Messiah. And we need to have the heart of in whatever situation, like it says in Philippians 4.11, that we will be content, that we will consider ourselves blessed no matter what. The last closing verse that I'll read here is Deuteronomy 8, um, verses 2 through 5. And this, this, is, this is just proof that this is just proof that Yah will remain faithful. He doesn't go back on his word. He doesn't go back on his promises. So if your suffering is for a day, for two days, for two years, for two decades, remain faithful and Yah will take care of you. Remain faithful and Yah will be there for you. And I love these verses because these are the verses that Yeshua stood on. In Matthew, I think it's four or five, when he went through the wilderness and Hasatan tempted him to eat food during his fast. And this is the exact response that he gave him. It says in eight, chapter 8, verses 2 through 5, And you shall remember that Yehovah, your Elohim, led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yehovah. Your garments did not wear on you, nor did your feet, your foot swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so Yehovah chastens you. Wow, Mishpacha. Yah allows us to go through these things so that he may test our hearts to expose what needs to be exposed, to get rid of what needs to get to be, be gone. He allows us to go through these things to see whether or not we're going to obey him and allow him to transform us, to see whether or not we're going we're gonna to complain, we're going to tempt him in that way where we're, we're not being grateful, but if he if he sees that we remain faithful, if he sees that we understand that we don't live by bread alone, that we don't live by our careers, we don't live by our material things, we don't live by our finances, we don't live by what we see in the physical, we don't depend on those things, our lives are not defined by these things, but that it, it's defined and, and we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yehovah. Then and only then, Mishpacha, will we receive the blessing in the wilderness. Will we receive the, the provisions and the faithfulness and the manna from heaven and, and the water transformed from a rock and our garments not wearing out and our feet not swelling regardless of the situations that we're in. If we remain faithful, then Yah will be faithful to bless us in these times. Amen. So I pray, I pray that this was encouraging, Ms. Pachai. I pray that whatever, whatever you're being tense, tested in, whatever your, whatever your wilderness looks like right now, um, it could be something really huge that you've been dealing with for a while. It could be something, like I said, an everyday thing that you have to deal with at work or with your family or something like that. But I pray whatever it is that Yah gives you the strength to be faithful. That Yah gives you the strength to understand that what you're going through and what you see in front of you, it, it doesn't define you. It doesn't define who you are. It doesn't get to dictate who you are. And it doesn't give you the right to complain and tempt Yah. May we stay faithful. May we honor Him always. So Shabbat Shalom. We love you, Mishpacha. Of course, Yahweh loves you more. Have a blessed Shabbat.